Anybody been there? So sorry about that. We'll pray for you. There's a place that fixes screens and stuff. But I'm so very excited to kick off a brand new series today as you kind of are gathering this conversation around what we're calling Life Interrupted. And if you're brand new to Cornerstone, welcome. So, so glad that you're here. We are truly glad that you're here as part of this body today. And we want to welcome everybody that's joining us online through our Cornerstone Anywhere uh, campus. I like to make plans. I don't know about you. I like to make plans and I like for things to come together. I like for things to go that the way they're planned. Anybody else in that boat where you don't like unexpected detours? You don't like for things to kind of distract you while you're trying to do something? Uh, when you're focusing hard on your job, right? It's just hard to handle. Sorry. Constant distractions for what you're trying to do. For me, when I'm doing my job, and what part of my job is writing sermons every week, so I do it in multiple blocks, and when I'm on a roll and I'm just really getting after it and I'm doing a great job writing, it's hard to just jump in and out of other things while I'm trying to focus. You know, while I'm trying to keep my focus in one direction, it seems like things always come up that take me away from that. And here's the thing about it, though, okay? In some strange way, Life is sort of by design, if you think about it, one giant distraction. We like to have everything sealed up. We like to have everything set just right, but it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes things happen in unexpected times. You can't always plan when things are going to go a certain way. Sorry about that. Despite all of our best efforts to control things and keep them how we want them to be, all right, how we think things should go a certain way, despite that, we simply cannot control it all. We cannot predict all of the outcomes and all of the interruptions that are gonna happen in life. We can't plan for the car to break down all the time. We can't always plan for the extra work that the boss is gonna put on us this week. We can't plan for the extended family situation that's gonna surface. Or you can't plan for your kid to throw up at school. You don't get to plan for all those things. I am so sorry. This could be, hang on just one second if you would. I'm so sorry about that. Hello? Hey, Mom. <laughs> Not exactly the best time. Okay, yeah. Yes, we are still coming for Christmas. And it's in four months, so we're coming, yeah. Okay. I think that sounds great. We love all those desserts. Those are gonna be, those are gonna be great. Yeah, could I call you back? Because I'm actually preaching right now, like this uh, central, but central time zone. It's like an hour, you know, different. Okay, yeah, I will, I will. Love you too, I'll tell them you said hi. Okay, love you too. Okay, bye-bye. I am so sorry about that. I just didn't know what that was for sure gonna be about. See, it's not just you. There's interruptions all the time in life when you're trying to do certain things, even while preaching sometimes, all right? Here's the premise of what we're wrestling for the next few weeks. What if life the way God intended for life to be was actually in one sense to be interrupted. What if interruptions at times can be built in intentionally? I mean, what if we're living in such a way that when we have an interruption, we are not, not knocked completely off course, but we are intentionally living, prepared for, and with the margin for interruptions that life brings our way? I never really thought of it before, but when you look through the Gospels, when you grab your Bible and you, you look through the Gospels, the Gospels in the Bible are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these four books that describe the life of Jesus. It's almost like Jesus' entire life is one giant interruption. I mean, the most, tra the most strategic event, the most planned for birth in human history was the coming of the Savior of the world, and yet... It constantly seems to like, like his birth even was an interruption. Remember in Luke chapter two, if you ever go back and read the Christmas story, Luke chapter two, Mary and Joseph are out of town. They're in another town called, that's it, Bethlehem. For the census, Mary goes into labor while they're out of town. The worst time to have a baby is when you're not at home. Even Jesus' birth was an interruption. And it was not to mention King Herod, who was in the story, he... Jesus' birth was a huge interruption to his life and his plan. And then there's Jesus' life after that. You look all through Jesus' life, it's like he is constantly trying to go somewhere and being interrupted from that path. He can't seem to say or do anything without somebody messing up 
his seeming plan. He always is on his way somewhere or in the middle of something when somebody stops him and asks him some challenging question or asks him to do a miracle. And amazingly, even the Son of God, who only had 33 years on this planet, has the most significant mission of any human ever. He was not angry. He was not dissuaded by the distractions or interruptions. It's almost like they were just simply part of it for him. In fact, Jesus was so interrupted that there are times where he is literally interrupted from his interruptions. If we went through the Gospels and we just cut out all of the places where Jesus was interrupted, we wouldn't have a whole lot left. He lived a life of interruption. One of the most notable stories in the life of Jesus that illustrates this is in Mark chapter five. If you have a Bible, go ahead and flip over to Mark chapter five. If you don't have a Bible with you today, uh, we're gonna put the words on the screen as well, so you'll always be able to see that there. Mark chapter five, beginning in verse 21, is a story, but it's actually multiple stories, kind of layered. Mark chapter five, verse 21. Jesus got into the boat again, and he went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd had gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him and all the people followed crowding around him. You could argue this man who we later, who was named Jairus is the first interruption in the story. Jesus was, already, Jesus was already in the middle of something. He was gonna be ministering to the crowd, speaking to the crowd, but now he's redirected by Jairus's pleas to go and save his daughter who has very little time left. Look at verse 25. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel, her, feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? Interruption number two. He's on his way now to see the little girl and this lady just slips her hand in and grabs onto his robe to get some healing power on the fly. But somehow Jesus felt it. He felt the healing power go out of him, which is an incredible thought, conversation for another time. But this is in the middle of a pre-COVID kind of crowd, okay? People are pressed up against each other, shoulder to shoulder. If you can imagine, you know, there, Jesus is being touched nonstop. Like everywhere you go, there's people touching. But he asked, who touched me? Who touched my robe? And the disciples reacted the way I gotta think you and I would have reacted. Right? I think they reacted a very natural way. If we were in that spot, the way that they react in verse 31 seems very appropriate. His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask, who touched me? Jesus, everybody's touching you. Everybody's touching everybody. But he kept on looking around to see who had done it, and then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Now this story came alive for me in a new way a couple years ago. I was in Israel and uh, we went to the ancient city of Magdala, which is where Mary Magdalene is from. She's the Mary of Magdala. And they've just started excavating in the last handful of years, Magdala. Over 2,000 years it's been covered. And they're just excavating it and it's amazing. And there's a church in Magdala and in the basement of the church, a modern church, and they've, in the basement they have this incredible painting of this scene, of this moment with this woman in the story, someone's depiction, and then take a look at this picture for a second, uh, in the basement. This is a giant, I don't know, 20 feet wide, okay? And it's, it's from the ground level, as you can see. We don't typically look at people's feet a whole lot, but you can see the lady's hand reaching in and touching the robe of Jesus, and uh, th right there, it's, it's so unique. The painting tells an incredible story, and no matter how many times you look at it, 
even though it's just a bunch of feet. You kind of see something different every time. One of the ladies in our group said, you know, of course Jesus has per perfect cuticles. You know, like that's, <laughs> naturally he would, right? This story is really important, I think, as we figure out how to live with constant interruptions. In one sense, instead of calling the series Life Interrupted, a friend of mine said, we could, 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 could just, you could just call the series Life. Because isn't that how life is? It's just one big interruption after another. Notice how Jesus handles it, though. He doesn't seem annoyed. He doesn't seem put off. He doesn't seem even aggravated that this lady's motivation is actually pretty self-focused, really. It was about her getting something for herself. Luke's gospel says, as well as Mark, that this lady had this problem for 12 years, and most scholars understand that she probably had a female problem she's wrestling with, endless bleeding, and now no money left for any more medical care. She's left to deal with this in incredibly difficult situation. She had a need that probably most people around her didn't even know about, and she desperately needed a touch from Jesus. And immediately when she touches even his robe, she's healed. And he could have kept going. He could have just stayed on the path, but he stopped and took time to minister to her. Look at verse 35. When he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw how much commotion and we saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. It's not here, but you may wonder for a minute if Jairus might be a little frustrated with Jesus in this moment. He knew his daughter had very limited time left. He finally got Jesus sort of uh, d moved into that direction. And yet Jesus stopped in the middle of his path to the house to deal with the woman that had been bleeding. And I mean, in one sense, she's already healed, right? Like, you don't need to stop. She's healed. We're good. Keep moving. My daughter is moments from death. What will Jesus do now? Verse 39. He went inside and he asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she is only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave and he took the girl's father and mother and, three, all, and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told them to give her something to eat. I love the story. It's incredible, isn't it? So, so life-giving. What an amazing Savior we serve. That Just in this little story, you just see his heart. And all of this, this whole story, all of this multi-layered interruptions, one right after another in the life of Jesus. He was already with a large crowd, then something came up and he goes with Jairus, then something else comes up and he stops to heal a woman, then he goes back with Jairus, then he ends up with the crowd. So what can the, all of this teach us today? Like what do we need to learn from the life of Jesus? Well, at least we need to recognize a few things, first of all, is that Jesus wants us to interrupt him. He wants us to interrupt him. He's not annoyed by our interruptions. He's actually very appreciative in a sense of them, if you want to call it an interruption. It's because he values his relationship with me and you so much. He cares about us and he's willing to meet us where we are in our timetable when we need and want him. And while that might be a hint selfish, Jesus meets us there. He wants us to come to him all the time. And you know why, right? Think about it like with your kids or grandkids and how they have a knack to constantly interrupt you when something important is happening, especially when they really need something. Can you think of an example, though, where you had a moment of actual, like, heartfelt, you know, like you handled it great in that moment when they, you were doing something really important, but one of your kids needed you, one of your grandkids needed you, and you, in that moment, handled it the way you actually want to deep down, and you were like, you know what? I'm gonna handle this situation. I'm gonna receive them. I'm gonna deal with, in and, and, and heart, I'm gonna receive this moment. 
whether it was a kid or a spouse or a friend or whatever, because ultimately people in our lives matter way more than our to-do list, and we know that. It's just hard to always live it that way. Jesus is never too busy for you. He's never annoyed with your request. He never responds with impatience or disgust when you come before him. And we should never project our tendency to feel that way, to feel annoyed or sometimes like sort of when we're interrupted by others, we don't really love it too much. Don't project that onto Jesus. He does not respond the way we do. He is perfectly full of compassion and even invites us to bring things to him spontaneously or in a moment of need. And I don't know what it is, whether, whether it is that we, you know, we think God probably has something better to do or that maybe we should just figure it out. We shouldn't have to ask him. We should be beyond this situation. We shouldn't have to, so we're like embarrassed to bring things to God, or maybe we think deep down he actually won't really care about it. For some of us, interrupting God is like a barrier. It's a hindrance. And we hesitate to ask, because we don't want to interrupt him. And you know who has no problem asking questions? Kids. Kids have a ton of questions. I recently read that on average, kids ask 73 questions per day, 73. And we probably only know the real answers to like five of those questions, right? (laughs) Because a lot of the questions are like, those two girls that are sisters, why does that girl have curly hair but her sister's hair is so straight? I don't know, DNA, (laughs) what's that? I don't know, it's a thing in us, it makes hair grow and stuff. That means, though, when you are a parent at home with a child 24-7, that in a given week, you are asked 413 questions by that loving child. And if you have two children at home that are speaking, (laughs) I don't even know what that number is. And if you're a school teacher of little ones with 25 kids in your classroom, we will pray for you after church, okay? Because there is a lot going on, lots of questions all the time. They just ask and ask and ask because they're curious and because they haven't taken the unfortunate hint that some grown-ups don't actually wanna answer their question again, right? Because they innocently are like, you probably wanna help me, right? Like, you probably care enough to hear my question and receive me where I am. Friends, so should we. This woman, she goes before Jesus trembling. This man, Jairus, he's weeping before Jesus. And Jesus doesn't correct him. He doesn't condemn them. He doesn't ask them to make an appointment. I'll get with you later. I'm trying to deal with the dying girl, bleeding woman. Would you please hold on? You've been dealing with this for plenty of time. What's 10 more minutes for you? He doesn't have that attitude at all. He receives them and he loves them. In fact, elsewhere, Jesus says it like this. In Matthew chapter seven, verses seven and eight, he says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks and knocks and knocks, the door will be open to you. Does that sound like a Lord who feels interrupted He is inviting us to constantly come to him. So you don't have to worry about annoying Jesus, right? You don't have to worry about interrupting him. He wants us to come before him. We can learn from this story and plenty of others that Jesus invites us to interrupt him. Now here, there's a a flip side to this, and that is this truth, right? Jesus wants to interrupt you. He does. Now while certainly The interruption was real all through his life. The reality is Jesus is the primary one in your life speaking into every moment and every thought and every decision and every path of your life. As the Lord, Jesus is an interrupter. He is in the business of course correction and redirection. The same Jesus that invited us over and over and over to knock and keep on knocking because the door is going to be open and that's how he deals with us or how he wants us to deal with him. He also says this about how he deals with us. Back in the book of Revelation, there's a very similar sounding passage, but it's kind of more talking about him. Revelation chapter three, verse 20, Jesus' words. He says, look, I stand at the door and what? Knock. If you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. And isn't there sort of an underlying assumption that, and if you don't, I will continue 
to stand at the door and knock and knock. And have you thought of it that way before? That when we invite Jesus into our lives, that he comes in and he wants to share a meal, but when sometimes we invite him in and we kind of open the door, we're like, Jesus, so glad you're here. But before long, we kind of nudge him back out to the porch or we kind of put him back in some dingy room in the back. We didn't necessarily mean to, but we're not really inviting him in for a meal. He's kind of put into a different spot in our lives. And yet, frankly, even when we have not invited him in, he is patiently standing at the door and knocking and knocking and knocking. And it's not like an, it's not a, it's not one of those, okay? It's a, it's a kind knock, if there is such a thing, a loving knock. But when we're off course or we're walking away from his path, he is there in our lives knocking in one sense, providing an interruption. Do we welcome the interruption that Jesus provides or do we consider him calling us back on the path, a, a bit of a nuisance? How do we actually receive the interruptions of Jesus? Because sometimes we don't like this reality about Jesus if we're totally honest. We really like this word that we have built into the fabric of the way we live our lives and the word is control. Anybody have a friend named Control? We like the plans we're making. We like the ability we have to determine what we want to do, when we want to do it, and make a change if we want to, or not make a change if we don't want to, and we like to have it all under control. We like control, and Jesus, by nature, as the Lord, is upsetting the apple cart of control. When we turn our lives over to Jesus, and many of us have done that, we've said, Lord, come in. Be the Lord of my life. When we do that, we hand him the reins and we say, my life is yours. My decisions are yours. My past is yours. My present is yours. My future, they're all yours. But then, like after a minute, we sort of try to like grab the reins back a little bit and hang on to a version or a, a percentage of control because we like to keep everything together just the way we think it should be. We kind of have this little package of our life and deep down, friends, deep down we know the truth, don't we? Control is a farce. It's a complete farce. Raise kids, you'll prove it. It's not real. The tighter we try to hold on, the more slips through our fingers. We can't truly control other people we can't control even most of the time our own desires or the outcomes of situations around us. We many times can't even control what happens in our own hearts, but we keep telling ourselves we can and trying to hold on to control. And then when life gets interrupted and our plan doesn't work out and we find ourselves falling flat on our face, we're devastated. And yet the whole time Jesus is knocking. He's quietly and calmly trying to speak in, but sort of subconsciously we're muting him because frankly, we don't really wanna hear it. We've got this, we got it, right? No, we don't got this. Jesus gave us a classic, you know, don't try to control your life verse in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, listen to what Jesus says. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you'll find it. Is it possible that some of the interruptions in our lives, as insignificant as they may seem in the moment, could be God trying to get our attention? It could be Jesus kind of picking a new spot on the door to knock. Could he possibly be using a delay in some decision you need your boss to make? Or a friend issue or something with one of your kids relationally, or you know, some friends that you're trying, that you're trying to deal with that's a, a relational issue in your life or whatever, is it possible that he's trying to shape you and teach you something about him through the situation and he's knocking and he's calling and he's trying, in a sense, to interrupt the path you're on? Here's the truth for us today, all right? Inconvenient interruptions, which is most of them, can become divine appointments. Inconvenient interruptions can become divine appointments. Certainly that does not mean that we never make a plan or we don't ever try to like 
put our lives in order in some way, all right? That's not what it means. Certainly that doesn't mean that we're never gonna make a plan or we're gonna wander around all day looking for interruptions. That's all we do. We just look for interruptions because we don't have a plan, so we're just gonna fly, no, okay, not quite like that. But it means that if God is in you, and God is in this world redeeming all people unto himself, that he can and he will use every opportunity to direct and guide us, he will. And learning to embrace interruption in a different way, it's not just about developing patience, which I'm sure it is. It's not just about letting go of some control, which it most definitely is. It's about experiencing the fullness of life that God wants for me and you. And on the surface, so many interruptions and inconveniences, they just seem like setbacks. But I'm not convinced Jesus ever saw things that way. I don't think if you asked him how that day went, he would say, well, I was trying to deal with the crowd, but these people incessantly needing me all the time. I don't think he looked at it that way. Author Jay Bias says that we typically handle interruptions with two pretty common assumptions. The first one is, that when we're interrupted, you were already heading somewhere and it's important. It kinda doesn't matter where it was. You were headed there and it's important to you. And the second one is that your goal is more important than the interruption, right? Where you were headed is more important than the inter- what you were doing, what you were making plans to do, it's more important than the interruption. And he says that we tend to think of an interruption as something less important that gets in the way of something that is truly important. But hold on, is that actually true? See, we live such hurried lives. We have very little margin for what God might be teaching us through an interruption, that the direction God might be wanting to steer our lives. You know the people in front of you at the grocery store? Interruption. People going slow in the child pickup line? Interruption. The person who, you know, calls on the phone right as you're walking out the door? Interruption. Interruption. The friend who drops by unannounced, interruption. The coworker who strikes up a conversation at 4.56. <laughs> Seriously, can we talk about it tomorrow? Interruption. What if we started looking at interruptions like that as, like all of those, as something not to try and avoid completely, but instead of to consider, is God trying to show me something? Is he giving me a divine appointment? Is he giving me an opportunity to live in obedience to him through an interruption, perhaps? Because after all, living out faith has more to do with loving people and serving people on their timeline and in their moment of need than it does us keeping our little plan together, doesn't it? Here's what C.S. Lewis said. The great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life, the life God is sending one day by day. What one calls one's real life is a phantom of one's own imagination, which sounds way better if you have a British accent, right? In other words, all right, what we started to allow interruptions, when we do that, to become just a regular part of life and living out faith, Is it possible that God is actually teaching us more with leaving a little margin for some interruptions that God might be nudging us along on our journey? Remember back in the story, Jesus, when he healed the woman, or he healed the little girl? I'm always struck in this story by the reaction of the crowd at Jairus' house. First of all, when Jesus says, she's not dead, she's only asleep, they all start laughing, which feels really inappropriate, doesn't it? Like she just died and they were just weeping and frantic, and then they start laughing at him. There's no way this could be a God moment, right? Like God's not gonna use a death that way. It was a major life interruption at the very least for all of these people close to this family until Jesus showed up. And then he turned it into something quite different. In fact, do you remember the reaction, the second reaction after they laughed in verse 42? Did you catch that? After Jesus heals the little girl, in verse 42, it says, the little girl was 12 years old. Immediately she stood up and walked around and they were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Overwhelmed and totally amazed. And I just wonder if we were going into each day saying, Lord, whatever it is today, 
whatever I'm gonna face, my life is probably going to be interrupted today. And I'm gonna walk into it knowing that there's a really good chance you're in the middle of the interruption and would you just overwhelm and amaze me with what you do? I can't see it ahead of time. I don't know how you're gonna do it. Overwhelm and amaze me, God. Overwhelm and amaze me with the interruptions or the redirections of my life. How much more often will we see his hand moving if we looked at it that way? How much more often could we see the interruptions as divine appointments if we were looking for him in the midst of all of life interrupted? And maybe you're in a place today where you just need to come before God and say, man, I'm so sorry for always thinking I've gotta have it. Because God, I know I don't have it all under control. I know I don't have it all under control. And for others of us, it's a matter of looking at this today and hearing the truth of who Jesus is and recognizing that we've never really given it over to him fully. We've never said like, God, take my life. Let it be an offering to you. I want every day to be an opportunity where maybe you even use me as an interruption in a sense. Maybe you use me, God, as an, as an insert to someone's life that will help redirect them back to you. God, I wanna give you my life. We'd sure love to have a conversation with you about that today. Whether in person after our service up front with our prayer partners or having a conversation with a service host online, we'd love to talk to you about that. Because God has given us reminders every day through life's interruptions that he is with us and he is redirecting and preparing for us divine appointments. Let's pray together. God, you are an amazing and awesome God. You are, you have shown us through the life of Jesus that, Lord, even in the smallest things, all the way to the big life things, certainly for this woman with bleeding and this family that lost their child, these are massive, massive life things. And you care about all of them. And the love of Jesus is clear in every life he touches, including every person in this room and joining us online. And Lord, you've invited us to recognize your hand in the midst of the interruptions. Would you just redirect us a bit today? Open our minds and hearts that we might see you. In Christ's name we pray.